so the goals are to really learn software engineering. So going, harking back to my student days, I've always been kind of uh, amazed at how bad software engineering is taught at the universities because back when I was doing it, you're supposed to have 100 people working for five years to build software. It's a complete mismatch of, the, uh, of what you're supposed to do with what you can teach in the classroom. So I, like students ever since then, would listen to the instructor, ignore what they said, and just build software at the end, just like we always have. Uh, what's great is what's happened is software has been reinvented in a way that makes it a lot easier to teach. It matches the classroom. So that was, I was excited about uh, coming back to it. So from my perspective, as you know, I, I do hardware stuff, uh, but I've kind of watched the software things. And so the approach that I turned it off again. The approach that Amanda and I took was, well, why don't we explain what's different between hardware and software? Uh, to explain why there are these differences here. Um, and the thing that's really striking to me, who does more hardware stuff, is why are there so many software disasters? Right? <laughs> it's, wow, what a, what a thing. So, the, in fact, the, it's kind of when you teach the software engineering, these are cliches. You know, it's like the, the prison thing about all they had to do was you know, say page 34, joke 34, and everybody laughed because they heard it so many times, right? These are cliches. The Ariane 5 rock explosion, oh yeah. Theric 5 lethal radiation dose, the Mars orbiter disintegration, uh, FBI file case abandonment, huge famous disasters. Now you may not have, in case you haven't, you may have heard of the Ariane 5 rocket explosion, but you may not have seen it, so I'm going to show it to you. So this is, uh, the setup is, you know, this is France, they've gone through a series of rockets. This is Ariane, the Ariane 4 worked great. Ariane 5 is a lot faster, okay, it's a lot faster. And so it's, it's recording its, its uh, miles per hour, and so it's got a bigger number, right? And so what happens? Oh, decoutage, oops, oops. Decoutage means takeoff. Decollage. Decollage. Uh oh. Uh -oh. That's a software bug, okay? <laughs> so what, <laughs> that what happened? There goes $350 million worth of satellites, all right, right there. So what happened, all right? So it kind of made sense to reuse the software that worked last time, but because this went faster rocket, uh, when, what, because memory was precious, they calculated in 64-bit double precision floating point, but they converted to 16-bit integers to save the information. So that was an arithmetic overflow error, right? A fairly dramatic arithmetic overflow error. <laughs> uh, one of the things in this class, we'll be talking about testing, the importance of testing. And that, that's a famous example of the importance of testing. You know, it worked before. It'd be a conservative thing to do is keep using software that worked last time, except for that problem. So what I would say has happened is basically there's hardware and software are very different media. and uh, the cultures that have grown up around them reflect that media and they're very different. So, for example, basically, uh, it has to do, one aspect is the cost of a field upgrade. So, Intel makes 350 million microprocessors for PCs here, 350 million. What would it cost to upgrade that? Basically, it'd be infinity, right? It'd be, it'd go around to 350 million people and fix the microprocessor. That would be uh, an infinite cost. So the hardware's really got to work. So what this means is huge amount of resources are put into making sure the hardware works. Uh, and if you get a hardware, uh, you get a hardware bug, you get hardware with a bug, you think it's broken, and you send it back. Um, software bugs, how, what does it cost to field upgrade? It's, it's almost zero. You know, it's, it's not really zero. There's some cost to it, but it's trivial to upgrade the software that Microsoft upgrades the software in 350 million PCs every year. So the culture and expectations are software is going to get better over time. That's, you know, it, if, suppose, so what it has a bug? Well, if it has bugs, I just got to get the latest version, it'll probably fix it. And given the field upgrade differences between hardware and software, that expands, explains a lot of the, of the cultures that have grown up around it. And the kind of interesting thing from the hardware perspective is hardware is most, almost as soon as you buy it, it starts getting less valuable, right? It's like it decays in front of you. <laughs> Within three years, they just throw it away. You can see this thing you built and slaved away for year, five years. 
and you can find it in a junkyard in three years. Software, this stuff that crashes and blows up satellites and all that, it lasts forever. <laughs> this software can last for a long time. We have an example in the book of a piece of software that lasted 50 years. I mean, the whole field's not much longer than 50 years. So the chance is software can last forever, and particularly software is expected to evolve. Uh, and that brings up this next important idea of legacy code. This legacy code is this fact that software can live for a very long time. Uh, and legacy code is software that people keep using. If to last 50 years, somebody has to use it. But there's kind of a negative connotation with legacy code in that you, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to maintain, it's hard to evolve, or it's antiquated technology. And typically today, 60% of maintenance costs is adding functionality to legacy code and only 17% for bugs. So legacy code plays this really important role. Um, but we want you to build software that's going to last a long time, but we, you don't want you know, the next generation of Berkeley students to call legacy code. So we decided beautiful code. We want beautiful code, which means it's valuable, it meets customers' needs, and it's easy to evolve over time. And that's what you're going to learn in this class. Now, the thing about uh, legacy code is it's usually ignored in both textbooks and classes. Uh, when Armando and I uh, decided we were going to do this, there's a lot of complaints of industry about software engineering courses. So we thought, hey, we'll take advantage of our friends and ask a half a dozen companies, OK, what you guys have been complaining about these courses. What should we be talking? Every single company, and this is Amazon's and Google's and Facebook, uh, Microsoft, every single company, the first thing that they said is you have to teach them how to deal with legacy code, how to enhance legacy code. It was amazing the unanimity of those arch rivals that they all said the same thing. Everybody's second and third choices were different, but they all said dealing with legacy code. So there absolutely is going to be uh, assignments in this course. We, we've added a chapter on it. The first three people said it. We tried to argue with them. No, you don't, want to, no, you don't mean that. How are we going to teach legacy code? It's going to be too hard. But by the fifth and sixth, we decided we had to do it. So the, newly this time, there's a chapter in the book about legacy code, and there's programming assignments that you'll be doing. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> you'll, be co you'll be dealing with legacy uh, code, and you'll figure out how to do that, yeah, both in the online course and in the Berkeley course. OK, now's a chance to try out this first question. So what type of software is considered an epic failure? Uh, the number one, uh, which I consider orange, beautiful code. Number two is legacy code. Number three, unexpectedly short-lived code. Or number four, legacy code and unexpectedly short-lived code. 